Now that we've discussed the basic structure of a nucleotide, which has its nitrogenous base, its five-membered sugar, in this case it's deoxyribose because it doesn't have the OH on carbon-2, and we know that it's deoxy because this is a discussion about DNA, and then the third component, which is a phosphate group. Now we can get into the different types of nucleotides that you'll encounter in DNA. With DNA, there are four different nucleotide bases that you'll encounter. There's adenine, represented by A, thymine, represented by T, guanine, represented by a G, and C here stands for cytosine. These are arranged into two groups. They have the purines, which are two-membered. Notice that this has two members of this ring, and so does this one. It has a two-membered ring. And the pyrimidines, which have a one-membered ring for their nitrogenous base. And there are different ways that you can remember them. I think a really good link is that a pyrimidine has a Y in it, and cytosine and thymine have Ys in them, T-H-Y and C-Y-T. Both of those have Ys, and those fall into the pyrimidine format, whereas the purine group, which has two rings, contains the other two, adenine and guanine. And once we have all of these, then we can start to assemble our DNA as well as starting to get into a discussion of our base pairing and complementary strands and things like that. So the first question is, when you have two different nucleotides, how do they bond to each other? And the answer is that they form a linkage between the OH group on one of the sugars and the phosphate group of the next nucleotide. So there will be an OH from this phosphate group that will connect to the hydrogen from its adjacent sugar. And then you'll have a condensation or dehydration reaction where these three will end up precipitating out as water. And then this phosphate group will be joined to the sugar of the next group. And uh, notice that it joins the sugar on the three carbon, the hydroxy group attached to the three carbon, whereas this phosphate is attached to the five carbon there. And then over here, we'll have a different strand. And this strand has an OH group from its phosphate that will attach again to carbon number three of this sugar. And in that process, you form a phosphoester bond. Remember that an ester in organic chemistry has the functional group R-O-O-R. Well, now that we have phosphorus, it's P-O-O-R. So it's going to be a phosphoester. And in the process of forming that, notice that we already have a phosphoester between our sugar on this molecule and its phosphate. Now we have another phosphoester between this P-O-O-R P-O-O-R, and so this is what's called a phosphodiester bond. It's two different phosphoesters, and that's what links one nucleotide to another and forms the backbone of the DNA strand. And this backbone is very important, and you might hear the term sugar phosphate backbone come up a lot. Essentially, you have a sugar that is attached to a phosphate group, that phosphate group is attached to the sugar on the adjacent molecule. Then this phosphate from the next one, from the adenine group, will attach to the sugar on the next nucleotide and so on. And so DNA and RNA both have a sugar phosphate backbone. And this allows you to form long strands connecting nucleotides with other nucleotides. So remember that sugar phosphate backbone which is produced due to a condensation reaction between the ribose sugar's OH group, or deoxyribose has an OH group, and the phosphorus group, the phosphate, over here. So it's that, that phosphate sugar or sugar phosphate backbone that forms the structure that allows DNA to assemble in large strands. And you see that going in this direction, and you'll also see that going here. Now, to form one strand, you simply connect sugar with phosphate, with sugar with phosphate, with an adjacent sugar. But usually, DNA takes the form of double-stranded DNA. And that involves having a complementary strand that it connects to. Uh, 
And so we'll discuss the formation of the complementary strand. We'll discuss the labeling of the different ends of it. And then we'll start to talk about the base pairing that allows these groups to connect to each other. Now that we've discussed the phosphodiester formation that allows us to create that sugar phosphate backbone that produces a strand of DNA, now we'll discuss the other forces that connect nucleotides to each other. And this occurs across strands, so between two different strands of DNA, and it's called base pairing. And the way base pairing works is you always have one purine that binds with one pyrimidine. And there are definite linkages. You have adenine will always bind to thymine when you're dealing with DNA. If you're dealing with RNA, then uracil comes into play. But adenine will always bind thymine in DNA, and guanine will always connect with cytosine. And it kind of makes sense because you have a one-membered ring and a two-membered ring. And thus, when you have AT groups and GC groups, the thickness remains relatively constant. If you were to have two strands where a two-membered ring bonded with another two-membered ring and then a one-member bonded with a one-member, then you'd have a very narrow part of the strand and a very thick part of the strand. So it's necessary that to maintain a uniform thickness or distance between the backbones of your two strands to always have a two-membered ring connect with a one-membered ring like that. And the way that this happens is that the A and T will form hydrogen bonds. And so the hydrogen from this group will connect with the oxygen there, and the nitrogen from this group will connect with the hydrogen there. And A and T, you end up getting two hydrogen bonds between each adenine and thymine. Then with guanine and cytosine, you end up having hydrogen bonds as well, but there will be three of them three different hydrogen bonds. So it's a slightly stronger linkage for that reason. But essentially what's happening is that due to the geometry and the identity of the different atoms in these nucleotides, they're very capable of forming hydrogen bonds that, that thus connect them to each other. And that's what enables DNA to form that double helix structure. It's the interactions, these hydrogen bonds between your bases and the shape of these bases dictates that guanine always will bind to cytosine and adenine will always bond to thymine. And so those hydrogen bonds essentially reinforce the structure and allow your DNA to arrange in a helix formation, which we'll go over momentarily. The next thing that we should talk about is after we understand how this base pairing works, and they call it base pairing because it's a pair of bases always connecting to each other. Now that we have understood how that works, we'll start to look at the composition of the DNA strands. And you may have already encountered the terms five prime and three prime, but essentially what that refers to is it's a way of looking at which direction we are going with our linkages here. So here we have carbon five. It's the carbon that shoots out of that sugar. And here we have carbon-3. And notice that all of the bonds are happening between a group attached to carbon-5 and a group attached to carbon-3 of another molecule. And the important thing to realize is that whenever we're assigning 5 and 3, we don't look at 5 here and 3 there. We don't look at the linkage itself. But instead, we look at the 5 end of this molecule and the 3 end of that molecule. So from 5 to 3, that makes it clear that our 5 end is in the upward direction and our 3 end is in the downward direction. And we can do that again with this molecule here. We have the 5 end and the 3 end. On the other side, we have the 5 down here and the 3 up there. Once again, five down here and three up there. So the five end of this strand is going to be in the downward direction, and the three end will be in the upward direction. And there's some terminology now that we can introduce in order to understand the way that they discuss DNA and the particular strands. The first one is we'll come up with a term called a complementary strand. Remember that adenine always binds to thymine in DNA. 
and guanine and cytosine are always the ones that hydrogen bond with each other. And so this strand has its pieces and the other strand has the pieces that are complementary. In order to form a double helix, you need the complementary piece at each point in this strand. So if we were to add, let's say, another adenine, we would have to have another thymine up here. If we were to add another guanine down there, we would have to have another cytosine. They're always complementary. So you have one strand and you have its complementary strand. So that's an important term. The complementary strand of DNA contains the, base, the bases that pair perfectly with your main strand here. The other term that we encounter a lot is anti-parallel. And what that means is that these are structured somewhat in a parallel way. But notice that here we've got the five prime end up there and the three prime end down here. So it goes from five to three like that. Here our five prime end and our three prime end move in the opposite direction. So yes, they're parallel, but because they're moving in opposite directions, we use the term anti-parallel to describe the orientation of these two strands. And it becomes very important to understand what five and three mean when we're talking about these structures because this relates a lot to DNA replication and whenever we're using the DNA as a template, we have to know this five and three organization. But the important vocabulary terms to take out right now are base pairing, you have an adenine and thymine, a guanine and a cytosine. So base pairing is an important thing. Realize that that is created by the hydrogen bonds that allow these two strands to stick together and eventually they'll wind into a helix. So base pairing is very important and it's formed by hydrogen bonds, two between the A and T, and three hydrogen bonds between the G and C. And then you have to know the term complementary strand, which is if this is one strand, it has a complementary strand that features the bases that will pair perfectly with the complementary strand. And the third thing is anti-parallel. Whereas this one moves from five to three going downward, its complementary strand will always be in the opposite direction. Five will be down here and three will be up here. And that's the structure of DNA always involves two complementary strands that are anti-parallel to each other, meaning that it goes five to three in one direction and three to five on the other side. So essentially five to three go in two different directions when you're dealing with DNA. And once you understand this, then we can get to the more complex three-dimensional structure of DNA and start to talk about the replication process.